people talk about it, you may completely change the topic. You never know. So um, that's kind of the plan. And um, we want to let you know that um, I know last week we went over a lot of things and very quickly. And and we left out a lot of things, and we're like, oh, we're going to say this, and we're going to say that. My birthday is this semester. And so, is, so is Cheryl. I'm just kidding. I know it. But um, one of the things is that um, sort of like, just like you do with your students, is going over your objectives and standards for what you're doing. And we want you to understand how this program evolves into this piece of the program. So you took 560, and you did annotations potentially, um, and you, if you took 560, and you, did, you understood research, and uses the library, and APA, and then you carried that through where you went to 565, and you learned how to do the designing lessons, and you worked on that, and you carried all of that through this program so that it built, and so that you are the professional that you are, to move into an area now where you are actually taking that knowledge that you learned in every one of those classes and applying it at a very more rigorous, higher level of critical thinking synthesis analysis. So that's how the program works. So just understand, um, sometimes it might feel like you came to the end of student teaching or phase two, phase one, with all your coursework, and now this might feel kind of disjointed, like, okay, this is a little different, but realize it is completely mapped to connect every course to phase two so that all of that knowledge that you don't even know some of it you have in here will be utilized and um, the skills that you develop, the content knowledge you developed are um, acquired, um, all of that will be um, added to your instructional strategy, skill toolbox to come up to this final 628 and 635. So you just want to make sure you understood all of that because as passionate as we are about it and um, you know I mean I, I just love research but it's just one of those things that you get into and we want to make sure you understand the, the, the progression and the connection and how the program was designed and mapped. Dr. Maria Myers would be very upset with me if I didn't explain that to you. She's long gone, but this she and now gone. Ah, <laughs> she's not gone. She's not gone. She's still dead. with us. She's tired. She, she's she, tired. Um, she created this program, and then over the years we, you know, changed it. And, and like Cheryl said, it morphed. Phase two used to be yeah, more. Phase two used to have three courses in it. It was thirty annotations, not twelve. And <clears> so <throat> things have been. You know, we moved annotation up to the front. You know, we just did some things a little differently. Um, to make it more impacting and um, effective for you and more efficient for everybody. And relevant to what you've learned in the past, to what you're teaching and what you're doing right. right now. And hopefully by the end of this journey, this ride, you'll say, I get it, I get it. And there were a couple of you that were here uh, when I was working with another project director from 635 and a student that just finished 628, 628 in the fall. And it's all coming together for her. And that's the exciting part. As you know in your classroom, when you see those kiddos that all of a sudden they're reading when they've struggled for months or however long it might have been, their struggle endured. But it just, like a light bulb, and it's coming together for her, and that's that's exciting for us as your instructors, but that's the goal, the path that you're going to follow. It really will make sense. Yeah, so just wanted to cover that because I'm to just jump into phase two without kind of helping to see that. So. And you should see that as adults and as educators. You've been through your own journey. You should see that. but. With our help, we want you to be informed of how it kind of ties in, and hopefully that reduces your stress and lessens your birth rate. So that was that was the objective piece. All right. Uh, actually, no. We what? didn't talk about the advising. About. Oh yes, critical. Very important. Okay, this is hugely important. So as you go through the program, you know you're checking off. I took this course. I got that course. And the licensure laws change, and oh no, I got to take a parent involvement, family engagement course, and. You're, you guys might be getting out for, oh no, that's, uh, there's a cultural competency course that's going to be required for renewal of licensure. That's, going to be, that's the new law, but you're not, not until you renew your license where you have to have that course. But, um, and it's only, you have to, you can't take it before you have licensure, so 
doesn't help us to add it to our program, so we're going to add it as like a, you know, a, a not a non degree pursuing course later on if you if you want to take it through us online. But because of the state requirements, um, for example, ELAB being added in 2020 and for secondary 2022, and, um, and side note on that, if you can get your TESOL endorsement now before 2020. You do not have to do the practicum. If you wait, you'll have a practicum added to that. So um, you probably have already heard that, but um, our TESOL courses are packed every semester because of that. So people are trying to get it done before the law hits. But um, when you uh, look at your uh, audit forms or your schedules or you go back through your notes, please make sure you have caught every uh, every check to make sure that you've taken every course is required. So I think it's 48 for elementary and I don't know what this is for secondary. Okay. It's, I want to say. The numbers change. Oh, no. It's 38, but I don't think, I don't know if that's I was thinking 38. Also. But um, it might be 40, but I've got it right here. So um, because I just want to alert you, every semester we've had anywhere from zero to five people that could not graduate um, Not every semester is only happening. That you know of. Yeah. <laughs> There's stuff you're I'm not just telling me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, like, last semester was a, a rough semester. So um, when things change, or if you weren't able to get a course, or you had one that you wanted to substitute for another course, because you took a call or transfer or whatever, um, you have to make sure that's all taken care of. Be, be right now, because you do not want to go the next semester, I mean, go through the fall, and then here comes time for graduation, and go, oh gosh, guess what? You need to take Helium 501 elementary rating. You know, that's the type of thing that could happen. So just, it's, it's your responsibility to make sure you've met the requirements. Your advisor um, in phase one should have, you know, been able to talk with you about that, but if you, if you, didn't happen to be with the, um, the advisor or you have some kind of just strange uh, situation because of transferring in a course or because of, oh, I was going to take that math course that I need to take for the you know, six credits of math, six credits of science and social studies for elementary. Um, just make sure you've got everything. It's your responsibility. So um, and maybe you already know it's all good and, and that's great. Great. But just we just find sometimes something gets missed and it doesn't happen. So just want to make sure you graduate as you want to next December. And then you walk next spring. And that's wonderful. We want you to do that. Be thinking about that. For the family, um, for your friends, your so significant fun. others. That is supporting you through this journey. And you go to incline, and it's usually it's beautiful. beautiful. It's a delightful thing. Uh, and we like to brag about our department. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, we they moved us to the front. I know we're so excited. So we're the first ones to graduate. As we should be. You're getting a master's. <laughs> Most definitely. Thank you, Beth. All righty. This is what our evening is going to look like. Um, I've got several handouts for you. Sorry for the trees, please recycle when you're done with the course, but uh, we're going to work in small groups, table groups, to help you understand and to help you kind of work through these annotations that are challenging right now because, as Jim and I were talking driving down, you don't normally speak in AP language. You do, you're kind of geeky, you know? but <laughs> seriously, that's a very, very formal language that you don't use on a daily basis, so you're becoming more familiar with it as you travel through SNC in your coursework. So we're going to kind of work together to help you learn how to build that annotation, your first two annotations that are due, and they're going to be due next <coughs> Thursday. Right. Today is Thursday, February 7th. So, with that said, I'm going to preface how your assignments will look. And then, uh, later I want to talk to the Tahoe group 
Um, I've secured a room. So <laughs> um, it will give us an opportunity for the Reno students to uh, be down here. And uh, you're welcome to go to either class. But yet, if you're up at the lake, living up um, at the lake in Truckee, uh, near me, then we will meet on the Incline campus. But most importantly, we're going to divide up to talk about your topics and your annotations. Some of you are just full speed ahead, and others are struggling a bit, and that's understandable. So we're going to try to work through that in a smaller group, which is delightful. Thank you, Beth. Very important. So next Thursday, February 7th, your first two annotations will be due. Keep in mind that those annotations will get feedback, not just from me or from Beth as your instructor, but from both of us as your instructors. So the first two, remember, are freebies where we will continue to give you feedback. The rest will also receive feedback, but those first two, you'll have the opportunity to turn it back in, to fix it and turn it in, and maybe fix it again and turn it in. But remember, you're going to start snowballing with the next three and four <coughs> that are then due, which will be due on February 21st. So once we get going with annotations, we are truly rolling. And for you, uh, you don't want to get too behind. So fix those first two based on the <coughs> feedback that you receive from your instructors at this point in time. And then from three on to 12, then whoever you are um, registered with will be grading your annotations. Know that you can always contact both of us, um, either one of us. Cheryl, but try to go to your instructor. Um, yes, Beth. Can you help me work through this? Okay, yes. I know it's to do on Monday. Um, yes. So next Thursday you're going to bring two annotations to class, and they're going to be peer edited. You're going to sit in here and work with each other. Um, so you need to bring one hard copy of each annotation because you're going to, you know, I'm going to bring mine. I'm going to hand it to Cheryl. And she's going to make all the edits. Then Cheryl's going to hand it to Jim, and Jim's going to finish it, right? So I've had two people in here <laughs> edit it. And then you're going to take it home and make your corrections on it, and you're going to submit it by electronic. Every Monday. So we're giving you quite a bit of time to input that feedback that you receive first in class. Next Thursday, you'll bring annotations one and two. This is a requirement needs to be done, you want it to be your best because your peers are going to read it. One and two, next Thursday, February 7th. Then, in class, we will do peer annotations. And I will give you the handout for that in a bit when we discuss the handouts that I sent this afternoon. Once you get those peer-reviewed annotations, which is also benefited by the fact that Beth and I then are working the room, we're working the crowd, and we're helping to answer those questions. So it's helping you to learn about citations, APA, um, how to cite seven, eight authors in your citation at the top of your annotation. With that, you are going to then take those peer-reviewed comments home Look at where your corrections need to be made, correct it, and you do not submit it to your instructors until Monday mornings at 8 o'clock. If you want to send it earlier, absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. But the latest you can send your revised, corrected, perfected annotations is Monday morning at 8 o'clock after our Thursday night class. So that gives you lots of time to make it the best that it can be. Right. So Thursday, next Thursday, you're going to show up with those two hard copy of each. Hard copy. Your, your teammates, classmates are going to edit it for you. And you guys, and what happens is, you know, I'm going to say, Cheryl, you should put a comma here. And Cheryl's going to go, oh, no, I, I'm, I'm going to pull my APA book out and show you you're wrong, Beth. I'm going to say, oh, my gosh, you're right. So then we both are learning, right? Exactly. 
So, um, these we need markers. I, yeah. Monday, the 11th at 8 a.m., you should correct whatever your you learned from in class. And by the way, um, your instructor, Cheryl, and I'll be walking around too and mm -hmm. helping with that. Then, on Monday, we're going to get them and we're going to work on them. Now, realize we're going to have about 40, over 40 annotations to grade each of us are because we're doing both of yours for everybody. So you're, you're two and there's everybody in this class, whatever. So there's over 20 people. So, um, we're going to grade those as quickly as we can because we're going to give them back to you. We always give them back to you by the, cl the class period on the 14th. Sometimes we just walk in with them and bring them to you. So you'll get those back, and then you're going to need to make those corrections, right? Or do we have a due date on that one, Cheryl? On the, there's no class on that 14th, though. Right? That's right. Right. That's, that's right. correct. That's why it should um, the, correct. So they'll be electronically returned. So looking at the uh, syllabus, I'm looking at page 24 of our syllabus now. When it says, for example, February 7th, annotations 1 and 2 are due, that's our class date, that's the date that you complete them by and bring a hard copy to class for us to begin reviewing it, the peer review and instructor review. Then, that following Monday, it's due. So. February 7th, 1 and 2 are due. February 21st, 3 and 4 are due. So that gives you about two weeks then to correct 1 and 2. And for each of us, me as your instructor and you as the student, to go back and forth with 1 and 2. Then, for example, then on the 21st, we've got 3 and 4 are due <coughs> during class. On the 28th, 5 and 6 are due during class. On March 7th, 7 and 8 are due in class. On March 28th, we have another um, assignment, which we will get to uh, on February 21st. But we're just working on annotations right now. March 28th, 9 and 10 are due. But you know we have 12 annotations. We kind of run out of weeks. So what we've done is we've incorporated your last two annotations, 11 and 12, which you'll be pros at writing by that time, right? <laughs> um, those are submitted when you submit your proposal, which is the final assignment, the compilation of your research. That's the third assignment. So, Here's what happens when Cheryl and I, your next week, your, your peeps will grade your work, will not grade it, review it. Then it comes, you correct it, you send it to, to us, we correct it, we send it back to you. You make the final, it's perfect, right? And, and when you send it, the, how many times? It's the second time you'll send it back to the instructor this first time. We will pull out all of those edit sheets that we kept and we're going to make sure you made all the edits that's what's talking about how sometimes you can miss them so find your own system whether it's a highlighter or you number how many corrections and make sure you made them well, I don't know however it works for you because that that shows us if you're actually paying attention to the work that needs to be done the other piece of that is if after the first two annotations we see some serious concerns we're going to let you know that we're not going to be we're not going to let you continue and struggle and feel like I, you know this is really a challenge we're going to we'll contact you and say hey let's talk about what we can do to give you some support or what you need because like we said early you have to be a strong writer to get through this if you're not a strong writer you need some support and you'll have to you know start making friends get a meetup group. I'm surprised there's not one, an APA write annotations meetup group. I can't believe we haven't started one. But so she, I mean so um, Cheryl, when it comes to we send them back to them on the 14th, they're we get they got all the corrections. When is the very final their last submit on one and two, what date is that? On one and two? Yeah. Well as soon as possible. But I would say the 21st, okay. but or do before. not, do not drag it out that long because 
remember it's beginning to snowball now because now you're working on three and four and maybe you've got five and six going on also as you're researching future annotations. So, uh, so on the 21st we'll look at them again to just make sure you made all of those corrections and that's when we'll have our heart to heart if there's any kind of concern. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Oh, and then one and two is different. Remember, we've gone over this one more time. Yeah. Of course, but from, like, in, in graduate school, you submit a paper, and that's it. That's your grade, right? I mean, in graduate school, you don't have, at least not in anyone I've attended, that they, an instructor edits it and gives it back to you and says, you need to make these corrections, right? I think I told you, when, when I went to University of Colorado, I came back, obviously you didn't edit your own work. You know, it gave me a B on the on on the work because I had three typos. But um, the expectation is, you're graduate level, you're a strong writer, annotations three forward. You're going to submit them as they are absolutely perfect final. So you'll have someone in here to help you, you know, in your in your group. But beyond that, when you take it home to edit it based on what your classmates have advised you. Um, that's when you have to decide for yourself if I need somebody else. If it were me, I would have two or three people who, somebody who does know, knows nothing about education, right? Because they'll read it and go, this sentence makes no sense to me, right? You, you know, it, I know it does to you, but can you explain that a little better or something, you know? Because you've got to realize what you're writing is something that could be published. And it could be published by um, an, a magazine that or journal or whatever, and they have someone read it. It could be something a map that you've done. And I'm an English person, but I'm kind of curious because I just wanted to find out what this research said. You want to make sure that a lay person can read it that doesn't really have the content knowledge you do. So, um, and that's one of the things we'll put on the. We'll give you some feedback, for example, that says this is too content laden. Explain your 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 philosophy behind it, or your the, the, the um, researcher's philosophy behind it, or something. Or maybe you. Use too many words. Yeah. Reduce the words because you're getting too lengthy. And some information doesn't need to be said. Less it's is more. Less is more. Remember because the saying, if I had more time, I'd write you a shorter letter, the famous <laughs> Shaw quote. And that's, I, my, when my brother was in law school, I, I was like, why don't you ever write me? Because it was before the days of this, how old it was, right? Before the days of texting. And so he said, I don't have time. Because he was, I used to have to do it thesaurus out when I read his letters anyway, but uh, he would still say, it, I, he said, you don't understand to write a two-page letter takes me about eight, ten hours, you know, because I, I revise, I, I mean, he's like really nerdy kid guy now, but um, so he wouldn't remember writing, but that's what we're talking about, less is more, um, make sure that what you're writing isn't really wordy like Cheryl said, because we'll, we'll get rid of all those, and I bet, I bet you learned that in 560, like, I know. You know, where those comments that are kind of opinionated and that type of thing will, will be gone. So with that said, now you've kind of got an overview <laughs> of when annotations are due. The first two are due, as you know, next week on the 7th. Bring the hard copy to class. But as Beth mentioned last week, do not get rid of any articles that you have begun to read or researched really important to keep those articles, save them because you never know, you might need them. And many times we've said that with your topic, your topic might go this way or this way, you're not real sure. But, so save those. But with one and two being due next week, and we'll have this back and forth, one and two are a little bit different. If you will turn to page 21 in your syllabus, please. Page 21. At the top, it's called the rubric for annotations. And I have put this up here. And I am also going to send around, Beth, if you would, one hard copy so that you will have it. For our distance students, we're on page 21. But this is included in your handouts that were sent electronically this afternoon. So should we print out the electronic email? Or don't worry about it. Because I printed mine out. Oh, I just didn't know. And 
That is your choice. Okay. Yeah. Whatever yeah. works yeah. for you, I'm a... So if I don't have to, you will print one out for me? Um, no. Okay. These are really important. Okay. So I, Every time. I really want you to have After all the best. Hand. Okay. So we're talking about... You left, so you left me a tip, so I really appreciate it. Okay. If you choose, some people I would have given well. more, but... Just I, think you're right. no. I have to... Got I, got I don't want to peek too early. So I've got it up on the screen. I've given you a handout, and it's also embedded in a short graph on page 21 of the syllabus. When your annotation is perfect, it's gone back and forth, one and two, between Beth and I, it's done, you will receive a rubric. That means you've gotten the grade. That means this annotation is done. It is history. And if you will note, the areas on this rubric, we are talking about exceeding standards, meeting standards, or below standards. Obviously, you need to be exceeding standards but you might start out at meet standards. If you start getting too many in the below standards, we will have an intervention. <laughs> we'll talk. But seriously, when you get this annotation, your annotation and the annotation rubric will be scanned back to you, you're done. You've been graded. You've got annotation one and annotation completed. Then we move on to three and four. What happens with three and four then is you're on your own. You submit as perfect as you can, and when it is returned graded to you, you will get the annotation and you will also get this annotation rubric. Okay, when so, you get that back, there'll be comments on it that, that will say, you're, you know, uh, you, you left out um, the hypothesis in the first paragraph. We're not going to. We, we don't have the article, we don't want the article, but we sometimes request the article to make sure, so be careful about that. Uh, the other thing is, when um, you get this back, um, I, I'm not sure how you grade it, Cheryl, but just a, a heads up. I'll circle, I'll circle, the, circle the box, and I'll put some comments in there. Right. Um, graduate students expect to come in from the very first and see exceed standard and I got you know every student emailed me why didn't I exceed standards on everything you know I can't understand this um, I don't think I've ever had the one person submit an annotation even 11 and 12 that met all exceed standards there was always a, you know a comma missing or something like that so um, something that took it from and so think of me standards is <coughs> passing right? And the goal is to pass this course. That's your goal. So the below standards is when you need to start, you know, meeting with us. Yeah. But keep in, mind, or drinking or whatever. keep in mind that <laughs> many people say, well, it's almost perfect. Exceed standards is perfect. If you make one mistake, boom, you're down to meet standards. Just one error on that annotation. We're tough. <laughs> and, um, it's because it, to be published, it has to, you know, you, I mean, now, not that we haven't ever read articles and stuff that you would say, oh my gosh, they misspelled a word, or they left out a word, or whatever, but that's the goal. And so um, when you get to the final, when you're editors, when the technical editors, you're going to understand how important that is. Well. And thank you for taking us to the final. So now we're going to the end of the class. When you submit your proposal, basically, with those perfected annotations to the professional editors, you want to be certain that when you get your annotations back with a rubric, if there's any corrections to be made, grade them, correct them right then. Do it then, because when you then submit <coughs> this compilation of 12 annotations with your proposal, and we'll go over this and also ad nauseum by the end of the semester to the professional editors, then you will be getting, you will be getting, hopefully, a perfected proposal back from the professional editors. 
But if you forgot to make the corrections, you might fail the class, and that's foolish. So as soon as you get the annotation and your corrected annotation back, make the corrections <coughs> right then and there. Because otherwise you'll say, oh, I need to get back to one and two. Now I'm behind. I haven't done six. We've had people say, oh, wait, I'm going to correct all of mine at the end. Oh. Okay. Number one, two, when you correct it, please make sure you save it correctly. People have sent us the same very first thing they ever sent in. And they go, like, oh, no, 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 I made all the corrections. But guess what? Not. You didn't save it. Exactly. So you sent us the first actual draft you did. And so... We'll see you next semester. So, um, and that's foolish. That's yeah, foolish. You just, just, you just make sure that saving thing is huge, huge thing that um, comes up. The proposal, like when you send it to the editor, is it like because you were saying it's um, not likely that you will be uh, exceeding standard in all aspects, but when you send it to the editor, should you be exceeding all aspects? No, no. Okay. This. Whatever you received on this stands. Okay. Good question. Yeah. It stands, but the editors are professional editors. We've looked at them as best we can for APA, but most importantly, we're looking at them as instructors for content. Okay. And is your topic viable? Mm -hmm. Is it valuable? Is it going to work? knowing you've got this 635 project okay. to create. And if you're submitting annotations that are well written, but we don't think they're going to relate to your topic, yeah. you've well, met the requirement of actually submitting an annotation. But it's not you're not going to be able to continue on because you're not, you know, you're not, and we'll point it out to you. The other thing is, when you submit an annotation after one and two, there are things that are um, basic, and so if you don't do them, um, We'll like draw a line at the at the, just at the top. I'll give, tell you an example, and then we'll write. This is as far as I graded because the number one thing that will stop it right away is the title of your um, article. You know the the first letters capitalized and then the rest are not, and we will get uh, annotation submitted with every word in the title <coughs> capitalized, and that's we'll talk like about that later. yeah. We'll, and we'll so something like that. It's like or you don't identify it as empirical or theoretical. Something like that. We will stop. We're not going to honestly kind of take the time to go through something when you haven't actually made sure that it meets the basic requirements. When I, I can't even look at the writing piece yet because the, the piece, there you go, that checklist. Oh, man, that's like your... This is the guide. Oh, this is it. it. This is it. So, I made hard copies for you. <laughs> I'll pass those out in a moment. So, when the two things next week that we'll be working with, that your goal then is the annotation rubric, but next week we'll use this peer review of article annotation, and this was sent in your second class handouts. So these are kind of the things that your peers will be looking at. And you'll get to a point where you'll be so good at this that you won't need this. But this is just a handy dandy guide for you to use with your peers next week. So enough said about that. And as you go through this throughout the, the process, you will actually get into discussions, you know, about that with you know explaining your article and somebody will question you. It's really kind of cool. It is, exactly. So I am going to um, let's see. I'm not going to bring that up at the moment. So, um, let's yeah, question. question. Yes. Uh, yes. So, like, the one that we wanted to, we do, and then after we get it, uh, after we peer edit it on the 7th, then we turn it in. <coughs> make your corrections. Make your corrections. Turn it on Monday. Is that for all of them? No. What do you mean all of them? Well, like, so annotations three and four, we have a peer review of annotations. Do I submit it to you guys after my peer? On that Monday. On right. that Monday. Yeah. So we're okay. talking Thursday class, mm -hmm. then you've got Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. And if you finish it early, send it to us because that helps our grading okay. also. So it's not all at once. So every Monday following Thursday class, we need it at 8 o'clock. So Thursday I just need to bring the hard copy. I don't send it to you guys. No. no. And then I edit it, 
and send it to you before my right. 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 What happens is when um, somebody in, in your class edits for you, you you take it home and you're you're getting out your laptop, you're going to make the corrections, you pull it up on your, your screen. You're actually rereading it again yourself, and so you may even make oh gosh, I don't really think I wanted to say this. You will start making your even more corrections. So you'll be surprised. Okay. I mean, um, that happens all the time where where it's improved because you now are it's, especially as you go through the course, you're going to get so much more skilled at it that you will even sometimes go back to earlier ones to make some changes. That it was correct, but you want to add something or change something a little bit. Earlier. Sorry, I just had a follow-up comment. Yeah. I thought I understood it, but then I just got a little bit confused okay. with the last. Um, we're only able to to edit one and two after the feedback. It's not every Monday. It's not annotations three through twelve. Mm -hmm. Wait, no, we're right? peer feedback. Peer feedback. Peer feedback. Yes. But but is that no? So one and two every Thursday, two annotations. <laughs> Bring a hard copy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring a hard copy. Here's it. Review it. Every, you go yeah. home and take it. You make corrections, and they're due on Monday. That to happens. your instructor. To your instructor. Yeah. You submit then, it electronically to your instructor. Right. And for every Monday, every for the rest of the term, for annotations one through twelve. Yes. Right. Okay. That's, that was my question. Okay. So technically, technically through ten, but we'll get yeah. into that. Yeah. Right. Because eleven but and twelve. Three and four it. and so on. Right. We turn it in on Monday and. Whatever grade, right. that's it. Stance. You can't. Yeah, that's right. You're yeah. handing it in, saying you're submitting it electronically, right. saying this is an A plus. All of these are done. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Two at a time. Right. right. One, two. Three, First, four. I was thinking it was just one and two, and then. No, no, yes. <laughs> Good question. So another uh, useful tool that we will be using that I'd like to introduce you to, and I'm going to pass out Beth, if you would. Another very, very valuable uh, cheat sheet, I call it, um, requires the use of Turnitin.com. And many of you mentioned that you're familiar with Turnitin.com. Raise of hands if you are. Good, good. You use it at your schools. It's a very simple website, and it's very useful for you and for us as a community to take a look at your work and determine originality in your work. So you will be getting a welcome email from Beth and I that asks you to log in to turnitin.com. And this is what it looks like from my side. Not real sure what it... <laughs> Did I step you know, on and I had them come out. Yeah, right. on Wednesday. Yes. Uh, try on the side. Yeah. 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 Like, let's say if there's a question that says you do not identify how many students were in the study. Then you're like, oh, I can't believe I did that. I just wrote down there were students from, you know, ABC Elementary School. So then you pull out the article and find it. Also, it helps because um, you're sitting there, you're reading somebody, you're helping someone, and, and they're, they're doing something that's kind of similar to you, and you're like, oh my gosh, I can tell you an article you might be interested in. So basically, I'm not going to uh, read this for you, but the first part gives you some information about turnitin.com. And we will be working with you on turnitin.com. This will become a very simple task for you to do, to use this website. So when you are writing your annotations and you feel like you are done, you're pretty much uh, completed best it can be, before you bring it to class, you can upload it to turnitin.com. And it's very simple. On your computer, it will ask you, do you want to upload it from this computer, from Dropbox or Google Drive? Or do you want to cut and paste it? It's so much easier just to, you've got it in Word, you saved it, and just upload it from there. In turnitin.com, and as you begin to use it, you'll become more familiar. But there are levels, like 
a traffic light, red, yellow, green, orange, so on, about your similarity score. And turnitin.com that the college subscribes to and many of your schools do, gosh, works with millions of schools throughout the world. So your work is compared to someone else's. And if your work is over 30%, then you will need to revise because the point of your annotation is to paraphrase, to paraphrase. Now, your citation is going to come up at the top, and we'll get to that later, exactly. Because you're using the exact information from your article, with the author's name, the title, volume number, journal number, the date, etc. That's going to be an automatic 6% hit against you. So, if your score comes up at 26%, then mentally take off 6% for that citation up at the top. But, the rest of the article, your text, you want to be so cautious. The key word here in writing your annotations is to paraphrase the information. But some stuff we don't want you to paraphrase because it might change the meaning, like the research questions. The research questions, you might want to embed them in a direct quote. Therefore, you're going to take a hit there also, a few points. But you can't paraphrase the research questions in most cases. But the rest of it is going to be your own wording as you summarize the article that you've read. So we'll get more into turnitin.com, but if your score is too high, then that's going to tell you that you need to go back and start reworking that particular paragraph, sentence, whatever. But it's also going to tell you who else in the world over on the right side has written it exactly the same. It's going to tell us that, holy cow, this is exactly what somebody from Concordia University submitted. Where'd you get this paper? I'm proud to say we haven't had that issue. I'm very not proud here. to not, say not, it. not at Sierra Nevada <laughs> College, so keep it up, guys. Maybe it's a lot bigger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, um, basically, um, with this site, it's really simple for you and it's really simple for us. And it really helps you with your writing. So it's another way that SNC supports you in writing, in APA. But um, as I said, turn it in will literally highlight in colors. Uh, and you'll get to learn those color bars, etc. But you'll log in and first before you do, you'll get a welcome email from us. Do not sign up. That takes too much time. Right. It's easier for you just to get a welcome email and click. You're part of our classroom. So we'll send that out in the next couple of days to you. The next sheet, I have told you, Beth, will you be my Vanna again? Hello. I'm going to take this one. I have told you again how important this is. One night, late at night, Jim can attest to this, I was frustrated with annotations, with annotation writing, and so I started creating bullets of the most common errors that we see. So on the bottom of the second class cheat sheet, it says APA writing style. On the back, it talks also about how to write some of the most common, common, common phrases and grade levels or ages of students, how to write them in APA. So when you're writing your annotations, give yourself some room and have this descriptor chart and note that there's some information on the back about your annotations, which you'll realize is valuable when you start writing. And then also have this second class cheat sheet. Use your cheat sheet. Because rather than going through your APA manual, oh, how do I write 10th grade students? Look on the back, please, of your cheat sheet. How do I write 10th grade students? Oh, 10th grade needs a hyphen 
because students, the noun, follows 10th grade. So you need to put a hyphen. It's very technical, but you will become a pro at that. Then, what if you said fourth grade without students? Do you need a hyphen there? Give that girl a <laughs> <laughs> no, you do not, because there's no modifying word after fourth grade or tenth grade. And numbers, how to write numbers. From Kelly, okay, this is a continuum of your learning from the whole coursework. Test question. Numbers in APA when you're writing. Zero through nine. Words. 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 Ten and above? Numbers. Numbers. Exactly. All righty. You've got that. <laughs> but that's also included on your cheat sheet. Okay. With that, let's then um, break into the types of educational research. The types of educational research. And I know you have lots of questions. We'll get to them. But hopefully, this will answer the types of questions that you're having based on is it empirical? Is it theoretical? So, also on the back, I was trying to save, I was trying to save paper on the back of this handout, which is the annotation rubric. I typed a quick definition of theoretical. Theoretical gets a little tricky, and sometimes it's hard to find. Sometimes it's hard to differentiate. Is it really empirical or is it really theoretical? But let's take a look at when you are writing your annotations. Let's start working off of this, the empirical versus theoretical descriptor chart. In your very first paragraph, if you are writing an empirical article, oh, can any of you help me? What is an empirical article? What is an empirical article? It's an article based on like, data from a study. Exactly. First-hand research. I came into your classroom. I did the research. All right. Empirical. The first paragraph will include the type of article. And this is a simple mistake that so many of you as writers forget to include. First off, in Bouchard and Watson's empirical research, tell us right off, is it empirical? Is it theoretical? The problem and the purpose. What were the authors trying to prove? The research questions or hypotheses. They stated very scientifically exactly what they're trying to prove based on the problem. And then the research design. <coughs> now, I'm jumping back to the educational research handout. Another paper that needs to be on your table or on your desk as you are working. This page presented to you first class handouts. This was given this, uh, it electronically and in your handout handed out last week. Mm -hmm. I, I could make some copies if we need them, but that's okay. We can share at this table groups, but the research design, tell us, is it a case study? Is it a survey? Is it observational? Did the researchers observe for a certain period of time? Did they do a longitudinal study? In other words, maybe it was a two-year study. Was it historical? The type of research that examines past events or combinations of events to arrive to an account of what has happened in the past. All sorts of research designs. And on this page, we are talking about the top is theoretical definition, the Below it, in the middle, is empirical, and then the rest are designs. Theoretical does not have a research design, only empirical. So that's in your first paragraph. Okay, so a couple things. 
your article is not going to specifically say this is a correlational research study in purpose. Study. Right. Sometimes it does, not very often. Yeah, it does. Some, it'll say maybe a longitudinal study often, or an ethnographic, or it might say a case study. But most of the times it does not, and you're going to have to use your best judgment. And we'll, when we read it, we'll know. And we'll, if I read something and you put historical, and I'm like, no, this isn't historical, I'll let you know that. Um, Theoretical, is theoretical, the only um, alternative for that is a meta-analysis, which is basically, reads like empirical. It's really, really dangerous, because um, it'll, it will present data as if it is, they actually uh, conducted the research. Because what they will do, researchers will take someone else's data and try and prove it. So they'll use that data, and then, um, Implement it in a different way. So as you read it, um, you, you're like, wait a minute, I don't. This sounds like they actually did it. Well, they probably they did, but they're using other people's research as their as their data. So just remember, empirical. The author did this. You know, they actually conducted that study. They were the ones. Theoretical. They're commenting on someone else's, or reviewing someone else's, or taking someone else's study and. Um, and trying to validate it, right? So if, if the article talks about how I went to a classroom, um, you know, that Watson did the study and, and students that wore blue shirts on Tuesdays always scored higher on their math achievement test, and then I say I went to the classroom and I did just, you know, just to show that students that, you know, I'm trying to prove her is theoretical, because I didn't come up with that. I'm taking her idea and I'm going to try and prove it, and do some type of research, but it's her, it came from her. My original research. Right. So what I want you to do then is we've gone over the first paragraph. The second paragraph is where you get into the meat of the actual research by the researchers. And then the third paragraph is going to be your summation, your own wording. But be cautious, so cautious, not to include your own opinions. This is where we really don't want you to bring in your background knowledge and express it in this. Remember, this is APA writing, and it's pure fact. It's pure research. Thank so you. taking what the researchers did, how would it benefit? How would it benefit your school, your classroom, your district, all students at that age level? Third paragraph's a little bit challenging. But what I want you to do now is we are going to work in table partners. Please turn to page 26 in the syllabus. You are going to use this example of an empirical article survey. Summary, excuse me. And I want you to use it to evaluate as a table to see if it meets all the criteria here in the empirical versus descriptor chart. You're going to be using this. One of you should have your APA manual out to confirm that it is correct. And then you might use the second class cheat sheet. Use your cheat sheet. And most importantly, use, I have a few, I can run some extras. Actually, maybe for each hard copy. Let me run a few of the, thank you, Beth, of the educational research, both sides. Because remember, down at the bottom, it's going to be the research design. That's where you'll have to uh, determine, but I think it's mentioned. It should be in the annotation. But. This is easy. That particular annotation is empirical, so you've got to start. That's a given. All righty. If you would then, please work together as a team. Take a moment. Read page 26, the empirical article. And then Beth and I will work around the room as you work together to determine and see how this annotation is put together based on the requirements listed on the um, descriptor, empirical versus theoretical descriptor chart. Thank you.
tell me, first paragraph, report, let's hear it from you. Type of article. How do you know? So. so, exactly. But with that said, second sentence, the purpose of the qualitative empirical research. What is qualitative? What is it? Research design. Exactly. So this author of this article easily incorporated, checked off two boxes, empirical and the research design. In this qualitative empirical research was to examine, what's that about? Was to examine. Did you find the problem or the purpose? Where was it? To their perceptions of success in making art. Exactly. Then, is there any research questions or a hypothesis? Yes. Question? Mm -hmm. The question examined in this case study was as follows. How do students define success in different contexts? Is this question a direct quote? No. No. Why not? There's no quotation marks. Exactly. It has been paraphrased. Why is there a page? Absolutely. You can paraphrase it if it doesn't change the meaning of the questions. Why is there a page reference? Then? Oh, because sometimes, good question, <laughs> professional editors will argue with us, but SNC and what we want comes first. So you're absolutely correct. A page number belongs after a direct quote, but I think it's on page 196, don't quote me, but in the APA manual, it talks about how if you want the author to make certain that the reader of your article can find what they're looking for, then oftentimes they'll refer to the page number. This is a really important question. It's kind of the basis of the article, so the writer put page two in there, just so that you could say, and Beth and I do this a lot when we're reading it, we start to question sometimes, is this correct? Is the writer, is the student being accurate? Oftentimes, I go to Google search, do a, a Google search, pull up your article, and I start looking at it. And I'll go to page two and say, yes, that's exactly correct. How do students define success in different contexts? So it's not always a direct quote. But if it's something really important, for example, this research question, then go ahead and use the uh, page number. I'll find that page. And sometimes the uh, purpose is pretty intense, and you've summarized it. And mm -hmm. you are afraid that once somebody, you know, if we read it, we're like, wow, this really brief purpose for this amount of work. Then you, that's why you put the page. We could actually go look and see that it was a more intensive um, purpose, but you've summarized it. Is, is there any um, is there any point where we would be incorrect in adding this page number? Mm -hmm. No. So we want to be so we no. never get points off or no, no, no. We might like, like, be good point, We might like cross point. it out to say you don't need a page number. For this. Right. But we, like for that, like Scott, we could have crossed that out and said yeah. But yeah, I was just confused because then I thought it because you're absolutely book. right. Yeah, good job. Quotation marks. Yeah. And, and it's the paper kind of goes back and forth between the two. Exactly. So with and without, but it's all parenthetical. So what APA is telling us that if you want them directly to find it, it doesn't have to be a direct quote. Okay. All righty. Okay, second paragraph. Are there any participants in it? Any age or grade levels? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do they talk about the Southwest? This was interesting. Um, that it was in a Southwestern suburban community. They didn't give the exact location, did they? No. We require a location, but oftentimes research will say in the Midwest yeah. or in South Central Oregon or in um, 
the West Coast region of a demographic of uh, disadvantaged students. They'll describe it that way without giving specifically the location. Notice that it says a southwestern suburban community. If they would have said southwest Arizona, southwest does not need to be capitalized because Arizona is capitalized and we're just talking about a general area of Arizona. But if someone wrote research and said, we're talking about the Pacific Northwest, that's the region, then that would be considered a capitalized uh, region. Also, if we said the greater, um, let's say, Southern California area, then Southern California is known to us as a specific area, and so it needs capitalization. Uh, minor detail, but very important when you're noting location. All righty. And then one more thing on location. Um, rarely, but sometimes there's no, it talks generally. Thank you, Beth. And yes. there's no location. But you have to write in the paragraph, no location was identified in this study. But use the words, this is very easy. Thank you so much for reminding me. In an undisclosed location. You can't say no location. Don't say no location. Yeah. But in an, that's the easiest way to get out of it. In an undisclosed location of the state of California. What would it? It would may not even tell you California. You exactly. They probably won't. Yeah, exactly. If you use um, the location was not mentioned, you could say right, that. Right. Or the location was not specified. There's many ways that you um, can say no location. Exactly. Because, because let's say the journal is the American Journal of, you know, English, I don't know what it, it's something like that. You're going to assume it happened in the United States. You know what I mean? They're going to, it, it's for, right. you know, that's why. Sometimes they just assume you understand that. And so, also, another good point, point, there's a lot of good research that comes out of Turkey and India. So don't be afraid to use articles that are from other countries because there's really good research. Um, not just in the United States. Are there any areas that you don't want us to use? Yeah, Texas. We don't <laughs> <laughs> Alabama. Oh, <laughs> sweet home. Oh, sweet home. Oh, sweet home, Alabama. Right, so exactly. So we can use anything. Absolutely, but, but again. It's quality research. Quality research, quality, peer-reviewed, that's really applicable to your topic. That's the most important thing. All righty. So, as you can see, um, this is a pretty strong annotation in that it has all the components. Not A++, plus plus plus, but it's got all the components in it. Then, that third paragraph. Let's take a look at that third paragraph very quickly. In the third paragraph, note your requirements are to comment on the applicability, the benefits, the usefulness of the article to educators. Please note, this isn't stated in the research. This is on you. This is where you must think. You must think. Do not regurgitate what the researcher just said. This is where you have to determine, is it applicable to the classroom? to administrators, to the district, to your school, etc. And you need to state, how can it be used? So, this author says, the study has implication for curriculum development and assessment in arts education. The researchers provided insight, but then, at the end, it says, researchers can use, excuse me, Teachers can use this research to guide the creation of developmentally appropriate and relevant curriculum for adolescent learners that fosters growth of technical skills and personal expression. So take a look at that, and now bring in your background knowledge. Don't give us opinions, but bring in your background knowledge and tell us how it could be used in your classroom, or how it would benefit that individual struggling student. So a couple things. That last paragraph has to vary. The yes. most common mistake is um, 
this <coughs> this research would benefit teachers because, because, or because and then our this article provides beneficial information for teachers because you've got to find different ways to uh, change that um, and also um, so I was say about that. Um, if you say something like you read this and you're like wow this this was in Impressive. They did this. They showed how test scores went up and all this stuff. You cannot use your final paragraph to say teachers can use this research to improve student scores. You have right. no idea if that's going to happen for anybody else, right? So you could say something to make a positive impact on learning or whatever you've got from it, but you can't promise. Sell, you're, you won't don't want to sell somebody that you oh yeah use this and they'll all be able to you know Good point. rule the world. So, but be certain that you go back to your research and determine what needs to be said in that third paragraph. Don't give us a bunch of baloney about, oh, kids are going to do great with this research. <laughs> or it's a great, what is it? No, the one we don't like is idea. Is it idea? Oh, oh yeah. It's yeah. A, Researchers do not have ideas. Big words. You're using professional language here. Sound Matthew. like a geek. Researchers don't have ideas, big ideas. I never want to see that. <laughs> the researchers' idea was, no, they proposed, they posited, they concluded. Big words. They determined. The research determined because that's what it did. It concluded. All righty? They didn't have an idea. Yeah, your yeah. word choice is going to be huge, and you're going to find out there are certain things that, like Cheryl said, goes crazy over idea, I go crazy over done, like the, the research done instead of conducted. If I see the word done, I, I just start, it's like, yeah. nails on. <laughs> Don't use oh, the and the done. data, the data, you'll notice on page 36 of your handbook, how do I say data? <gasps> Data were. It sounds very awkward. Datum is singular. Data is plural. But the researchers collected data, therefore it's plural. So you always say data were collected. It sounds very awkward. If it's too awkward for you, it does. Thank you. Rephrase it. All righty? Rephrase it. Oh, the other thing then. Okay, when you're writing something, you were writing technically, so you wouldn't write um, a sentence and the next sentence be something that could have come before, right? So please don't do uh, write a sentence and then say, then they did this or whatever. Then they did this. Right. Don't use word did either did or done. But then they, you know, next, whatever. We're going to know it's sequential, right? So you don't have to tell us then. I don't want to do then this, then this, then this. So, yeah, we already got it. Okay. So. Exactly. And best favorite is. Shall I say teachers that then? No, I'm not as another one too. Who? After after um a noun. A noun that is a person you want to say who. Like teachers who, students who, not students that, or teachers that. And another cheat sheet. We give you so many tools, you won't know what to do with all of them, but <coughs> use them. I mentioned last week that pages 19 to 25 in the handbook are for you. EDUC 628, but yet, please refer often to pages 33 through 36 of your handbook. There are specifically on pages 34, 35, and 36 some information that is extremely important for you. For example, in this, we talk about English language learners and you need to spell it out the first time. Which one was really the Oh, here, this one. Okay. Thank you. Um, English language learners, you're going to write, spell it out the very first time, probably in your first paragraph. English language learner. And then what should go next? ELL. ELL. ELL, thank you, the acronym. Or maybe just EL if it's just um, English learner, whatever. If it's plural, how can I write it when I continue in my, let's say, second paragraph? ELL. Apostrophe. Nope. Possessive. No, because that's possessive. Oh, yes. That's possessive. It's going to be ELL with a little s to show that it's plural. You always spell out 
first, and that's listed on page 35, and then you write ELL, that's the acronym, goes in parentheses, which then affords you the ability to not have to spell it out through the rest of your text. You can just use this acronym. Cheryl, can you start a sentence with an acronym? Oh, no. <laughs> no, you cannot. Reword it or spell it out again. Do not start a sentence with an acronym. Do or not start a sentence with a number, like 12. Like, like number 12. Yeah. Spell it out. Also, remember, whatever the researcher uses as the word yes. English language learner, and they, if they put E-L or if they put E-W, you have to use what they put, right? Even if it's something, and you've got five different articles, and one article they use E-L, one article you use E-L-L, -L, one article you use E-W, whatever. That's exactly. what you have to follow, what the researcher uses. And our annotations are based on proper English spelling, so go to your dictionary, dictionary.com, and uh, determine how it should be spelled. But think about, let me see, let me think of an example. Um, there's different spellings for different words. Exactly. So that's a good one, Beth. Right, yes. and that's that's where it comes up too, especially if you get a British or a European, you know, you're going to have theater spelled with R-E instead of E-R at the end. Of but follow the researcher. Follow your article. Also, socioeconomic, we use that a lot in our writings about our kiddos. Socioeconomic is now, it used to be hyphenated. Now it's one word. One word. So, check that. Are you accepting um, them as a singular? Or does it have to be he, she, so? You know what? You try to stay away from pronouns. Actually, it says on page 36 in here, do not use pronouns. Okay. Avoid pronouns. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, this is like, I'm telling you, this is technical. technical. So really, there's a lot of really good um, uh, cheat sheets she. in. You, it would still be he, she. If you had changed to. recently to them, them can now be used as a singular. Right, but they we just things. don't use pronouns, so we solve okay. that problem. There you go. Do the best you can. Perfect. And instead of saying the researchers and then later saying they, then go back to maybe use the authors. Or then yeah. cite Bouchard, Watson, 2019, stated, concluded, etc. So these are the little things we'll get into. I want you to look very quickly at the theoretical article that then in your syllabus begins on page 28. This is theoretical. Please read the first paragraph very quickly. It says right there, most important thing, first thing, get the authors written correctly. Remember when you're writing an annotation, <clears throat> the top citation, you use an ampersand sign. In text, you use and, the word and. And this book, I'll say this over and over, my favorite page is 177, write this down. Page 177, in writing your annotations, again, it's a quick guide to the basic styles of annotations. Well, what do I do if I have six authors? Then you can use et al. If I have one author, no, I'm not going to use et al. If I have two authors, you always write out Bouchard and Watson in your text. In parentheses. 177. 177. 177. Are you guys on overload? It's okay. They're on overload. We're almost done. Uh, 177 of the APA manual. This will be invaluable. It will help you create your citations at the top. Citations are you use ampersands in text. In text, when you're writing sentences, you're going to word, use the word and between your authors. In parenthetical format, at the end of your paragraph, writing or sentence, that is an ampersand also. But this is the little detail that you'll... Okay, 
in text, always and between authors. In the citation at the top, between the authors, ampersand. In parenthetical format, in parentheses, at the end of a paragraph or sentence, ampersand. And these are the details that we will probably include in your review and definitely um, remind you of until it's stuck in your brain. Also, I'm going to pass out one more handout. On page 10 of the APA manual, it talks about empirical. Very briefly, it has a paragraph of empirical definition. It has a uh, definition of theoretical but it also talks about a literature review. In a literature review, Beth is a pro at this. Yeah, I'll find it. Can't use it. Can't, yeah, she'll find Can't it. Can't use that, or dissertation, or federal reports, and there's going to be some things you find that you're going to like, oh my gosh, this is the best research, and it's great, it's awesome. Well, we, we agree with you, but it's not, it doesn't meet the requirements. Because a literature review is not based on someone else's original research. So, I want you to take a look at the first paragraph very quickly and see how it might be different. You're not pros at theoretical yet, but you cannot use a literature review. Specifically, the reading teacher published by the International Literacy Association is fabulous for classroom use. But Oh, I'm so sorry. That's all right. I but, haven't even won all the rest. <laughs> but, um, as the reading teacher goes, great for classroom use, with strategies which will be really valuable when you write your lessons in 635. But oftentimes, <coughs> it's not based on any research. It may be very scholarly and well written. For example, Maniac. His theoretical article described, described, red alert, described five phonemic awareness strategies that the author used successfully in kindergarten and first grade classrooms over several years. Red flag right there. What's wrong with that? It's not his research. It's not his research. Is it anybody else's? No. No. <coughs> Look at the beginning of the second paragraph. Maniac discussed the positive effects of phonemic awareness instruction on developing the reading skills of young children. Key word, he discussed it. Did he base it on anyone else's research? No. This is a fabulous article. A student submitted it to me. I said, can I use it? She said, absolutely, because she had to write another one, because it was a literature review. So, be cautious of your literature reviews. Page 10 of the APA manual. When you're searching for articles this week, <laughs> and um, you probably, like, if you get frustrated at all, wow. did you find an article you enjoy, um, or has research in it, or sightings that you, that you like? At the end of most articles, there's a list of their references that give you everyone they use the research they use. So those those are actually great a well, great kind of way to find some if you're not finding what you're looking for. Yes, question. Do you think I've been writing correctly for a long time? Because I would I thought it was like Maniac's theoretical article article describes. Like it's supposed to be with your past and not a D at the end. I know everything's in past tense. Everything's passing. Everything's right. past tense. Everything's past tense. And so be cautious, that's another common error yeah. that Beth and I will note in grading your annotations. Research has happened already. You're reading it because it's happened. Therefore, past tense. Um, I'm passing out this last piece of material that I'd like you to sign. I want you to pinky swear that you have read the syllabus. This is required by Sierra Nevada College. Please sign it and give it back to me as you leave the classroom. Those of you that are distance, are distance students, you will find this in your handbook on page 32. Please sign it and scan it back to me. Uh, I'll look forward to it. Okay. Sign this. Gather your things. Those of you that are the Tahoe group that want to meet in Tahoe, Beth is going to talk about the Reno group for your topics, and we're going to talk about topics. We'll go into room three, Tahoe group. Okay, and we have to deal 
um, with, you know, and, and Jim had some good ideas about what the lesson plans might look like for that. They would be more like staff development lesson plans and things like that to introduce the best practices handbook. Um, and so that's kind of my idea. I, given that that's where I'm going now, I haven't really I like it. found the stuff. I but like it. I think you and I, like, almost a year ago now, that was kind of what we had bandied about briefly on the phone. And, that's perfect. Um, and that's what I think I told you before very quickly about Katie that worked for Microsoft. Right. And so she created um, basically a handbook about using Word and Excel and PowerPoint and all that. Right. This was a few years ago, but in the classroom. But it was really more geared for what she needed. Right. She followed our rules, but... That's what, Jim, that's what Jim was saying. He's like, he yeah. used her as an example, and it was... Oh, excellent. Was I heard you got... I wasn't sure if you were talking about Megan or Katie. Um, we talked about both of those. Uh, both of them, Actually. right. Yeah, because... Thank you. Katie's is... One, she's a she's service. Service. forest service. Oh, no, Megan's a forest Megan's, service. So yeah. I, I, I met her years ago doing Great. stuff with the forest service, and I... Makes yeah. sense. So that's... Okay. Perfect. Good. Perfect. Tor. Uh, I'm Tor. Um... I've, I know it's the hot topic and I'm a little bit struggling because I didn't want to do something that has so much on it already, but that's kind of what I feel the most passionate about and I have the most experience and it's most applicable to my um, teaching scene right now, but is SEL and so social emotional learning. And um, I was kind of thinking it would be really cool to create, um, you know, we've done so many workshops and PD days at our school about the benefits of social emotional learning, but I feel like um, the teachers that have been teaching, at least in my school, in my experience that I've met, um, have a hard time implementing it, and it's um, mm -hmm. not necessarily, they're not disagreeing with the research, but it's just, well, I don't have time to do that. I can't do morning meetings. I can't do, you know, and they, they find it so hard, and it's such like a big task to overcome. So I was thinking it'd be cool to, um, look at the issue of implementation of using social emotional strategies and techniques um, in the classroom and how teachers can implement that through a core subject area. Perfect. So. Perfect. And remember, your topic needs to be standards driven. If you're struggling, go to the standards right now. Look at the standards and look at some of the key words that they're using and that will help you with your searches. But in this case, she's going to use Washoe County School District SEL standards, not necessarily content standards. And that's what I was going to ask just to hone, as I started to try to look up on the Prim Library and do the find articles, and it's just hard to you know, type in the three key words, and I'm like, well, what is it? You know, like, exactly. And um, am I using the SEL, or am I just using... Um, the social studies and then SEL into it. But Actually, you're using both. both and your lessons right. will use both. They'll have SEL and they'll have the content standards. Yeah. In it. So, so it'll kind of be both, um, but it's showing that you can still teach standard driven material, standard driven material um, with social emotional techniques and strategies. Right, exactly. Um, and you have to. It, it yeah. needs to be incorporated into every curriculum area. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, that's my <laughs> she sent me her. Um, uh, sometimes our email doesn't. Um, work I just got locked out of my email this morning. So oh. if you sent it this morning. No, I no, it was a couple of days ago. Okay. Yes. I've Tuesday. been trying to call the IT desk and they don't answer. So. Oh, they are overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Send them an email. Okay. Yeah. Most definitely, or create a help desk ticket. You guys know that your spot on the uh, homepage of SNC, up at the top it says students, uh, gr current graduate students, and then that page has pretty much everything you need. I'd like to introduce Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer was not with us. She's a distance student. She lives in Markleyville, California, but she's going to, when she can, yep, try to get down here. Try to get down here. She doesn't have to, it's not a requirement, but on ground it's sometimes more beneficial. Yeah, yeah. Jennifer, tell us what you're doing. Um, I'm incorporating GIS and other spatial technologies into all aspects of secondary education. So, um, GIS, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Um, it's geographical information systems, it's mapping. Um, it's something tangible students can play with and touch and do. Um, everybody, you have it in your cars now, people have it on their phones, like you don't know how much you have it and these kids, they already know how to play games, they play Fortnite, I mean Fortnite is essentially, it's mapping, 
mm-hmm. and uh, and getting kids some um, motivation and all that kind of stuff by incorporating it in the classroom, I think is going to be huge. And unfortunately, I don't see it um, in my student teaching. There were so many times where it could be used, and nobody knows how to do it. Like the teachers now, it's not in our you know our pre-teaching. You know, part it can be used in all subjects. Um, Excellent. So, what subject? What grade level? Jim? So, high school, secondary. High school, um, secondary, and what subject? So, content the area? core area is going to be STEM classes. Okay. Um, but I want it to be, you know, applicable. It's the thing about NGSS, uh, the um, standards are they're they're cross they they're cross concepts. So. So it can be social studies. It mm-hmm. can be project based. It can you know you can have literature. Um, you can bring all the classes into it. So, so you want to integrate, but be cautious because then again you're getting too wide. I so I am just pick. like getting it in there. <laughs> like that's that's like you know just um, having the articles. Um, I've done kind of pretty much got the research ready. Um, so Good. so mostly like just this this works. And the problem area is it's not in there, so how do we get it in there? And then developing kind of those lesson plans, those basic lesson plans where teachers don't have to know GIS to teach GIS. Um, so that will be the, the big thing, like where you don't, a subject, you know, that's the cool thing about being teachers is um, to, to take material and be able to really not know it but learn with the kids exactly. because you have to stay one step ahead of them yeah because <laughs> yeah, technology changes so fast and right. if i make something to how to use the tool yeah. it'll be old before it is even exactly. done and so to to create contents and, and uh, lesson plans that are flexible and can grow with the technology that'll be kind so of basically cool. very quickly what you will probably do in 635 think about it have this kind of in your in your mind as you're working through your research. You may have to create a professional um, project that half of it is professional development for the teachers. So you're teaching the teachers, okay. and then the second half, how do the teachers implement and deliver that? And to that the can students, be I can do which is your like kind of doing yeah, okay. the tour. Exactly. Okay. So and it doesn't it's all have to be lessons. Plan. Six of those. Well, right. they're all lesson plans, but it's more focused on how to teach the teachers what mm-hmm. to do, and then mm-hmm. the second part is how to teach the students, so actual right. lesson plans that the teachers can use. Yeah, I think the teachers have kind of a hard time getting their head around spatial learning. Absolutely. So, yeah. But also, you need to teach them where to find help, research, right. the knowledge. As you say, it happens so quickly, as yeah. we well know. Yeah. Technology turns around. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. Maria. Um, so my main focus is um, seventh grade science, if I can specify it. Um, and I don't know if everybody remembers, but there's the ABC strategy, the activity mm-hmm. before content mm-hmm. strategy. Um, I really like the theory behind it, but I like everybody else's. I don't really see it being implemented that much in the classroom because okay. there's not that much time. Um, and, you know, if you're doing a lab or something, half the time it goes way longer than you think it's going to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, or kids just aren't getting it. Um, so, yeah, I wanted my focus to be on the effectiveness of the ABC method and kind of along the same vein, kind of teaching the teachers first just how to be able to incorporate it into the lesson plans um, efficiently, just like it just comes second nature to them. Um, and then the second half, I guess, for the less potential is going to be the student. Um, are you student focusing, based. Ariel, on a, like, are you life science? Uh, general science. General science. Yeah. Okay, so this is going to be general science. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. All righty. How are you doing with finding research? Um, there's a bunch, actually. But Good. I think my main thing is to figure out if it's empirical or if it's, yeah, not. Exactly. There's a bunch out there, though. But a lot of it's a lot broader than just the seventh grade kind of level. But or okay. middle school in general, I guess I could look into. But. And and that's okay. When you're looking at your research, you can look. For example, 
uh, let's say Jennifer's doing sophomores. So you might want to look at the middle school research and maybe even junior, senior high school, maybe even some college. So kind of before and after, get kind of a general area. It doesn't have to be just your grade level. So you can kind of see where they're coming from That's and really where they're good. going. Yeah, because I was confusing that. It would have to be so narrow and specific. Yeah, on the same, same vein, does it have to be your core content study area like would it have to be social studies no it could just be social emotional learning implementing and or oh. eis and that's what i was hoping because that's yeah. what i was like because you can't so if it's not grade level and not a certain it core content specific, relevant, that makes your research way easier perfect so. no but no because you might have what i sent to you the other night or last night i guess it was only last night it was only last night so then, um is he was talking about um, uh, using music to incorporate into a second language learning, but yet uh, you could also use PE to incorporate, you know, kinesthetic learning, whole body learning to cement the learning of a second language. So if there's some good research that's in another content area, but it's specifically Tied in. tied in speaks that to makes it, so much easier. it makes yeah. it easier but don't go I mean yeah. don't pull something from health and music and science and math place, don't be awesome. all over the place but there can be some studies that will validate what you're looking for Sasha hi, hi. Sasha. oh I'm sorry <laughs> yes this is Sasha <laughs> um, so I don't know I had one idea for a topic and I've been struggling to find research on it which is weird to me because it's Pretty good. Huh? It's a, well, it's just like a, something that I thought was like a big, just like kinesthetic learning, and I want to do it in math and apply it to maybe like, because I did my student teaching in kindergarten, everything's very hands on, but right. I feel like it sort of gets phased out in the upper grades somewhat. Um, but I'm having a hard time finding research on it, so I might be changing my topic. Oh, I like what you're doing though. I really do. What grade level are you looking at? Second or third. Second or third. Okay. So you could look up like elementary, kinesthetic, and learning. Right. <laughs> I did all the. I like wrote and built. I don't know. It was really weird. Like I got one on like college, undergrad. I did hands on. I tried like multi sensory learning. What's your content like, like, area again, Sasha? I'm sorry. My what? Content. Uh, uh, math. Math. Okay, you're gonna put it into math. I'll send you um, kind of what I sent. Um, and just some brainstorm some words, but go to, to help you in your search. But again, go to your standards for second grade and see what it says. And don't just look, look at math. Don't just limit yourself to math. Look at PE standards and maybe even health standards because those consider the whole child, whole body learning. So think about that. Did you use the word maybe interactive? or Because oh, I have this um, stuff on spatial learning, and so some of that I is... I tried spatial, but I did, I did like kinesthetic, multi-sensory, hands-on, and I was like, how is there not really... Yeah, why isn't this doing Why am this? I not getting any hits? For, yeah. And I tried all that learning. There was learning. a lot of spatial I found stuff, like one that was a really good research article that was for like college students, yeah. undergraduate college students in kinesthetic learning. I was like... I feel like that's a bit of a stretch, right? No, Sorry. but, so, take a look. Jennifer's got an article there. Jennifer, turn to the very last page of your article. Always go to the references. If you've got a good yeah, article, look at the references at the end of your article because that's going to lead you to, it'll start finger net, basically, networking out. The fingers will start spreading and you've got your tentacles that oh that's kind of good and it will help you. You can also go on to like Google Scholar and yes. just type in, you're not going to use those articles, you want to use ones that have been all checked by the Penn Library, but to actually just get the the like what they're using as far as the terms. The main reason you, you can know? use the Google Scholar ones is because you get to pay for most of them. Yeah. Do you really? They, they give you about this. They give you. But you don't have to read it. I'm just to like read the titles to see what they're using as words sometimes. Just like the synonyms. To give, so, get some. So okay, what could I be words. researching and like because that's just quicker. And then like things. And but, this may sound insane. Uh, go to the bottom of the Wiki Wikipedia page for that. Oh. Go to the bottom references. of the Wikipedia, and it's good. They have Wikipedia know. has incredible references at the bottom if, it, if they're good they articles. Do. And go down and look at those and look at the words they're using. 
because those are, those articles, while they may not be scholarly articles, they're going to be applicable to your topic. To your topic, um, excellent, Anton. Oh, I was I was I was working on a master's in American history, and a lot of that, if a lot of the Wikipedia pages, you go to the bottom, and there's real articles there that they used for one sentence up there, but. They're, the guys who do it are, that's their obsession, they're psychopaths, and so this, <laughs> it, you can actually follow those, and they can actually really help. But know that when you go to Google Scholar and you get the abstract or a little bit, a few paragraphs, then get the DOI, copy and paste it into Prim Library, and hopefully right. you should get the free article. So you're not, do not buy. Yeah, do not, definitely. Okay, we're getting some good interaction and dialogue. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> hi guys, I'm Sulema, and I wanted to do it on like how movement and music helps us learn because I feel like that's how I my, my remember more things. Mm -hmm. But same as Sasha, like I couldn't find a lot of things. I put like our integration, music integration, or music activity, children's songs, a bunch of different ways and. I couldn't find a lot of stuff, so I was thinking I should have a backup and like something. Have you had a chance? From Not yet, but then you sent me that email and I felt hopeful again. Good, good. I gave her a I feel list. like it's such a good topic. It I'm is. I'm very passionate about it. Yeah. So. And you'll find it. I just want to hear about that. And as I said, it was kind of, some of it was based on, I found some articles that another student used for learning a second language and based on music and um, the TPR method. So I'll send you kind of the same thing, Sasha, so to give you a, a jump start. I think my problem was that I was like seeing something and then I was like, oh, it's not first grade or it's not just yeah. language, and then I would dismiss it. Get up, you want a range, you want a spectrum to kind of, as we mentioned before. That will help a lot, and yeah, you're not totally helps. tied to that phrase Definitely. You guys are great. Gosh, you have a good search. Any other questions? Okay. Actually, I have one. Sorry. Okay. Good. Um, I have, For the good of the audience. I've, I've noticed in like all the kind of the research we did in the back in 560 yeah. or whatever class, good, and, good. and now that there's always one article that seems to be like the article of research for the topic. Got it. And it's old. Um, so, so I think I have enough articles. I don't need to use it. But my question is, it it really is like the main body of research. The foundation. Yeah, foundation. and and so I think that um, you know, um, it should be maybe. I, I understand, you know, the ten-year limit for for this, but for the next thing, is that something that can my definitely or whatever article can be based around? Is that foundational Send me article? An email and let me know because sometimes, as I mentioned last week in class about the gentleman mm -hmm. who did the comic strips, 1940 something, that's so foundational, yeah, you know, so applicable that yes, yeah, sometimes we can use okay. it. But if you're talking. You're talking technology, Jennifer, so it, we have to be really right, cautious right. And it's, because technology yeah. changes yep. so much. So yep. we try to really stick with 10 years, 7 years really yeah, is no, no, in I education, did. really important. But I but, just noticed that. I noticed that last last time I did it, I was like, there's that one article that is like the article. Of and, it, and it might be your anchor, definitely. It, so so um, okay. definitely let's talk about okay. that. Um, either call me or email me or text me or something. Okay. Alrighty. So, where are we meeting next week? Bye. What time? Five. Five. What will you bring with you? Your two, two hard copies. Four, one, and two. Two hard copies so that we can do peer review. Alright? This is delightful. Thank you all so much. Right. Jennifer will miss you. Thank you.